Okay, so this is part of an asynchronous lecture uh, being recorded for operating systems class. And we're going to pick up where we uh, left off last time. And that's on how system calls actually occur. So pretty much whenever a given system call is made, the parameters for that system call uh, get pushed onto the stack. And C and C++ for historical reasons, that's done in reverse order. Um, so it was FD buffer and in bytes. <coughs> when you made the call, but then they get pushed in the reverse order here. And then the actual system call is made in step four. And then here at this point, the library procedure puts the system call number in a place where the uh, operating system expects it, like a, a register or something, right? Here in step five. And then in step six, the trap is executed to switch you from user mode into the kernel mode. And then the kernel code starts following the trap instruction, um, examines the system card, uh, the, the uh, system um, call number, not card number, call number, and then that is um, takes you into sort of this little dispatch table, and that number corresponds to a memory address where the actual kernel code corresponds to that system call is, and then um, it actually starts running the code for that, and then eventually at step eight. Um, that's, that's what that handler does, and then at step 9, um, control is kind of referred back to, um, oops, go back a second, is controlled back to the user space, um, library procedure, um, following that trap instruction, whatever it comes next, and um, then the procedure returns to the user program, keeps moving on like it did with the rest of the routine, and then it returns to whoever called it. Um, user program cleans up the stack in step 11, increments, you know, stack pointer enough to remove the parameters for the read call and moves on with life, basically. So that's kind of what it goes through for any of the other system calls, just more or less complicated at that point. Alright, a quick review of the different um, help sections in, in, in on, a, on a Unix Linux system. Um, typically speaking, um, move this out of the way. Um, if you go in the man man, it'll tell you how to use the um, online reference manuals. And that's what man is, manual, right? So the manual of the, of the manual, right? Um, and this table here kind of just corresponds to what that slide is and what the different sections um, can tell us for any given command. When you open it up at the top, this number up here corresponds to the section where you're at. So, one are executable programs or shell commands, like the online menu. Two are the system calls, so you see a two above is referring to that. Three are library calls, functions within program libraries. Four are special, um, are, are, um, is documentation on special files, usually found under slash dev. Uh, section five menu entries are all in file formats and conventions, right, like the password file. Uh, section 6 is entries on games, which I never really see come up or anything like that. Uh, section 7 are uh, miscellaneous, right? Um, so macro packages, conventions, um, that sort of thing. Um, section 8 has system administrative commands, usually only for root. And 9 are kernel routines that are non-standard. So things that you don't, don't normally come across or see or get involved in much unless you do work on the kernel itself. Right? So those really are the sections. Um, so, for instance, if I did, uh, I can even specify the section I want to, like man2 um, read, for instance, because this is the system library call for um, read that we just just discussed. And there you can see the parameters, the file descriptor, the buffer, and then um, um, how much the readout read from that buffer. And then it returns back to you how much was read, and this typically is an integer type value system, and one of those type defs sort of thing. So, um, but because of that, it's done supporting things like s size max that sort of thing, and that's pretty much it. Because see, it's the number of bytes read is returned. So. If I do man3 read instead, that does the library call implementation rather than the system call. As the type of header file we include here is that. Whereas, I think. No, it's the same. Okay. Um, 
It's just ones at the system library level and the system call level ones at the library level. Right? Um, yeah. So there may be other things that I don't know, like uh, is there one for there? Square root is a library uh, call function level. So like including the math library and here are the different forms of that and how you have to link with it with the math library so on and so forth um, so, whereas if I try to do it for the system call level you're not going to find this right? no manual entry for square root in section 2 and uh, generally speaking there probably isn't a command line utility for it right so um, if you want to look up by a term or trying to find something appropriate you might do a man dash k and then the thing that you're interested in like um, unzip or something like that and it'll give you other things that kind of match the the string phrase that you give it so and notice these are all user level programs here that all of the ones here if I do I think it's still true too I do zip yep um, Say read. You get a lot of stuff because reads and a lot of things. So, um, but here we go. Here's section one: read a line from standard input one, and just posit compliance. Two for the system call library version. Three for the uh, library version. There. So, and the same thing with the uh, read directory, system call, and library call versions. So on and so forth. Um, let's see here. And I'm, yeah, I think uh, you go into man for password, you get the file items. Yep. I guess it's not set up on the system to do that. Right. Password files, oh, because it's section 5, not 4. 4 would be for drivers. That's why. Um, And then that would tell you about the password file. So one line per user account, seven fields delimited by colons. The fields are login name, encrypted password, numerical user ID and group ID, so on and so forth. Right? So, and it reads through it and, and you can obviously tells you about related files like the shadow file and that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, so good stuff. Right? Okay, so other system calls that are interesting. So usually there's a one-to-one -one mapping of, of POSIX um, conventions to systems calls in Unix, but not always. It could be a library call, it could be a sub-user program, it could be a script, it could be lots of things. Um, it still makes it POSIX compliance, it's just implementations vary by platform. Um, performance is uh, generally better out when you don't have to issue that. A uh, system call that involves the issuing of a trap instruction to switch you over into kernel mode and having to go back, right? It's really expensive. It's bad enough to make a procedure call in a user program from one spot to another. To do a, a, a user, the kernel, kernel, the user um, um, set of calls or set of instructions, right, um, is expensive, relatively speaking. Um, but we can go through a few of these real quick. Fork obviously takes your current process, duplicates everything about that process into its own process space and its own process table entry, and um, and then it starts running independently of the other uh, executable. Generally speaking, you combine it with something like XQVE um, to replace th the process you just um, you just um, duplicated um, with what actually it is you want to run. Um, in that case, you give it the, the name of the executable, a set of arguments, uh, an environment to use if necessary. Um, and then, um, but anyways, yeah, so yeah, at that point, from fork, they're already going their separate ways, and XQV really kind of forces that to happen. Um, so the variables have identical values at the time of the fork, subsequent changes only affect one or the other, right? It's because they are independent. Um, program text before the execute of VE is shared by both. That is one thing they do keep. Um, let's see here. You can use wait PID 
uh, on uh, you know after you're doing the fork and you can say um, let's see I'm trying to think if um, if I'm if if um, if the value returned back from white PID is um, or returns a value um, it's zero if I if I'm the child and I ask for the PID and it says um, zero um, from that call, then I know I'm the child. If it returns a non-zero, I know I'm the parent, and that value is the child process ID. So it always confuses me until I have to think about it for a bit. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to think what else would be good. Um, and we'll play around with doing our own little shell later in the course. Um, yeah, I mentioned XQV, uh, XQV is used for um, executing some user command in, child, in the child process. Um, there's a whole bunch of variations of that. Um, some make sense in certain cases over others. Um, and then obviously exit with the status code just terminates that process. Generally speaking, exit zero would be normal return back to OS sort of status. Um, And don't forget, processes in Unix have sort of this, um, have different sections, right? They have a text section with the program code. They have a data section that grows upward containing the variables. They have a stack that grows downward with the procedure call parameters being held there. Um, yeah. And obviously segments in, you know, in memory. Um, there, is a, there is a system call. Um, that you can use below malloc, right? So malloc might be a li is really a library call, but um, I don't know if it's sort of BRK. I'm not exactly sure what it's short for. Not break. It wouldn't make much sense, but um, but it can be used to control memory allocations. So, all right. Um, so yeah. So here would be a stripped down shell. Where one process doesn't pass, doesn't start multiple processes up. It doesn't pass data from one process to another. All that good stuff. It just forks the process and lets it run. So the way this is is forever and ever. This shell um, displays a prompt, then reads a command from the user, and then it forks its current process. And it comes back as um, the process. And after it forks, they're both identical in the same spot and they keep moving forward. The value returned back from fork is not equal to zero, then it knows that it's the parent process and that value is the child ID. So then it waits on basically the child X. It can use a negative one, so I haven't specified the actual PID return. It just can use that and it has a status, some uh, structure that it can use. And uh, I forget what that third parameter is. Just options. Um, you can help to control the call itself. And then obviously, if fork is, is equal to zero, we come down here, and then it does the xqve command, and with the command execute and its parameters and all that good stuff. So, um, go to the next section. This is what I was talking about. Each process has a stack space that grows downward, data space that grows upward, and to this. Um, um, gap. Um, you can do an expansion of the data segment by using the BRK system call at the lower level. You can do it at a higher level with um, with malloc. So and I believe that actually is how it's supported. I didn't mean to BRK. I right, changed data segment size. And you supply it with a pointer uh, to an address. And then change is just SBRK, and it's just a program break. Oh, it is break then. Um, and the process is data segment. So the program break is the end of the process is data segment. Um, increasing the program breaks has the effect of allocating memory to the process. So this is sort of like a, you're getting a chunk of memory, and you do whatever you want with that chunk of memory to kind of divide it up. Whereas malloc kind of helps you um, just to get enough for a given data structure and kind of 
does a little bit more manage, but you still have to remember to free it up. Um, and it sets the end of the data segment to the value specified by address when that value is reasonable. Um, you might have to use uh, set R limit to change that. Right? Uh, and then SBRK can just increase it by a certain number of bytes. So it's good stuff. So just one that's at a lower level than that. And I'm pretty sure it's not a three, right? But if I say malloc, it's not there. But if I say level three for malloc, see it's there. Right? So so library call level. Right. Let's shrink that down. Um, so yeah, so processes have that text state and stack segment, right? Um, text growing, uh, text is fixed. It's um, Data growing down, or growing up, stack growing down, um, and hopefully the two shall never meet. So. And technically speaking, BRK is really not part of POSIX. Programmers should always try to use malloc and stuff. So there you go. All right, so the next set of system calls in Unix land um, are the file management ones. So opening a file, the mode that for opening it, are what those two parameters do up here. And variations on that control other parameters. And then its correspond its co its counterpart is the close command on that file descript I was returned from an open call. Um, use that at the very end of utilizing that file. Read and write calls on that given file descriptor and number of bytes to um, read or write from a given particular buffer. And then there's a, a, a L seek, right? Or I don't know, is that, is that like locate seek or line seek or something like that. Um, and again, you give a file descriptor, you give it an offset for it, and you give it a, a wince value. Right? And, um, and L seek goes from the beginning of the file um, so many bytes. Oh, 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 it goes from the beginning of the file if wince is um, if is is the um, whatever seek underscore set is right in terms of an integer. You can include the appropriate header and use those nice type def kind of values, right? If you do seek underscore current. It'll seek from the current spot where the file pointer is. You do seek underscore end. Um, it'll do the end of the file. And those are just int values that are tied to some type of type def. Um, uh, let's see here. The stat command just gives um, for a given file a bunch of metadata on it, like um, size of the file, the time it was last modified, that sort of thing. You have to be careful with the timestamps that are returned by stat or even by the command line version of stat because especially if you move files across file systems, the, the creation modification dates tend to get all messed up and you can't really rely on it. Um, sometimes it's preserved, but most of the time it's not. So just be careful with that stuff and you know take it with a grain of salt. So. And then here we can kind of see an example of this, right? So if I stay I take this text file called oracle.txt and I say stat oracle.txt because that's sort of the command line version of, of calling this stat system call. And then it just in this case it'll do that call and then just present everything in sort of a nice neat format for me. So oracle uh, txt is a uh, 120 byte file. It has zero blocks. It's um, it's a regular file. Uh, here's its access modes: read, write for everybody. Uh, here it's its access modify and change timestamps. And it was last accessed and modified and changed. Um, it's I know values. We'll get into those a lot more. Uh, later on in the course, and number of files that link to it, or it links to, I guess, 
and then so on and so forth. So some good stuff there. And you don't have to write your own program that calls the stack command. If you don't want to. You can just use this command line program, and you can obviously put that into a script if you want. So. But if you do look up the the code for the system call version, and you make that call, and it returns that structure to you. This is what that structure looks like. So it just barely fits on here. It tells you a lot about that file, right? Like the ID containing the file, the ID number, file night file type of mode, and a lot of those are their own structs which have their own sets of fields, right? And um, it can get complicated pretty quickly. And it use things like, you know, from number of 512 byte blocks and that sort of thing to it describe size and all that stuff. And obviously you can perform a few little simple calculations and pretty that all up and it's good. Right, the next set of system calls are directory and file management. So you can make directories and remove directories. Um, you can take a file and, or you can create a link to a file. Right. Um, in this case, name two. So you create um, create a new entry that is the link that um, is connected to whatever the real file is in name one. You can have multiple of those. You can um, yeah, you can have them under different names, right? That link to the same original file, and that's useful um, for being able to only take up the storage in one place, so and not have things get out of sync and have different ways of referring to it that make sense in different contexts. Um, and then there's commands because. We don't have the notion of separate drive letters or anything like that, but what we can do is if we have one global root file system and we can, from empty directories in the system, create new mount points that connect us to different uh, storage devices. And we take the storage devices and they start at the point where the mount is created, and so on and so forth. So. Now, if I recall right, um, links are supported at the system sort of API library level in Windows. Um, you just don't see it in Windows Explorer. It's not like a direct menu option that you can do. You can create programs that'll create um, links. Um, it's sort of, a, like I said, it's an API thing. There's a command line item and, and you can get to through like command prompt or sh PowerShell that will actually let you create links as well. I just can't do it, you just can't do it through Windows Explorer. And it works just fine. And you can even do soft links or hard links just like you would in Linux. Uh, let's see here. I think there's even like a, a mount, you can't mount a, 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 an entire drive, a partition. Um, onto a dry, uh, onto a, a folder. Um, I think you can mount it. Oh no, you can do it to a folder. I think you can mount, do a, there's a mount command. We'll see if I can think about it later. Um, but in any case, for the mount and unmount stuff, that's common, that was common back in the day with CD-ROMs. You would do that. You'd, you'd, you'd mount the CD-ROM drive um, that had a disk just to put in there. Um, today that's all sort of automagical. And even though, even today, um, it's probably still good practice to keep in touch and, um, with with how that works because you know we we use USB thumb drives or you know various types of SD card media that sort of thing and so there's still a need to you know um, be able to mount those types of devices. I <laughs> You should really unmount here as well. I apologize for the yawning. I'm just I'm really tired from my treatments. So, all right. Um, so in terms of systems calls for directory management, every file in, in Unix has a unique number. We just saw that in the stack command earlier. It says 
I like these nice neat little two digit numbers, right? You saw what that unique number is for that Oracle text file. It's big, long, and, and just ugly, right? So, and here's two directories for linking the uh, Jim's memo um, to, I don't know, AST's directory, whoever AST is. And um, you can tell when something's linked because the inodes will be the same. So here's the memo in Jim's directory, right, 70. And then after the linking occurs, AST created the link called note, and note is a link to memo, right? So he created this link, he's going to call it note. So whenever he edits the memo, he edits note, like VI note, and VI note really loads um, memo that's under Jim structure. Now the permissions have to be right for this to take place, but generally speaking, it works. Um, you can generally do ls space uh, tac li to get a long formatted listing with the inode values. You don't have to use the um, the uh, fstat program. You can just um, do dash li just to get those um, inode values for whatever it is you're going to do with it. Um, only after all of the references have been removed can you actually remove the file. So. You can use unlinked or uh, remove at the command line to remove a link. So you can use unlink, and that's sort of an older way of doing it. Or you can use rm. Unlink obviously will only work on a link, right? So it's a little bit safer from that perspective, although I don't think it's real common for folks to do that. Maybe it is, I just don't realize it. Maybe I, I never really learned using that command very often. Um, you know, just, I guess just how things roll. Um, and then obviously mentioned before, you can do mount points, like assume that this is a secondary disk uh, in the system, it doesn't get connected at boot up through slash etc slash fs tab. So instead, you want to just manually do that. So at the command line, there is a, a, a mount command that you can issue, or you could do write a program that would do a system call as well. And you just say mount scb0, right, under the dev, um, you know, the, the special files, and put it at, at the root mount point and the zero is just mainly no special permissions or parameters or processing that should occur. And obviously if that disk is a um, not a like an ext type file system, for, at least for Linux systems, a lot of times you have to specify the type of file system and then typically you don't want to specify a number of other con parameters to control the loading and operation of that partition at that point in the file system. So here it is before the mounting, right? Here's mount, mount is typically empty. Uh, generally speaking, I would create a directory inside a mount because I'm going to probably have multiple mount points. I generally will follow the convention and, and put things here. You can create your own directories so and do it wherever you want, quite frankly, but um, do it under, you know, user or home. This user stuff is, this almost has a more classic Unix and Linux feel, right? There's an, a home directory here, per se, but, um, you know, typically speaking, you could do it down further, but um, so, but from here is fine, and um, it's just before and after the call. Okay. So there's the mount file system at the uh, system call level, right? And you give it a source and target, and then you have to give it a file system type, right? File system types could be BTR file system, I guess better, I don't know. Uh, EXT two, three, or four, four is being the most recent. A JFS, XFS, um, VFAT, which is a Microsoft thing, uh, uh, Fuse, you can get a TempFS, um, yeah, a number of those choices. So, um, ISO 9660 for CD-ROM, I guess, um, and um, yeah, that's about it on that. Okay. So the next thing are the, um, in terms of system calls, is the ability to be able to change your working directory, right? So when your program starts, it, it's working directories where the program is, but you can change it and then be able to do um, file operations without having to do an absolute relative path uh, um, specification. Uh, you can do a change mod or change uh, the protection bits on that, all right? Uh, you give the name of the file and you give either an octal code or using the 
uh, user group um, world permissions, UGO, um, whether you want to add or remove, read, write, or execute pr protection bits. Um, you have kill. Uh, that's a favorite one of mine when processes lock up. So, uh, for instance, one I know squirrely on Ubuntu is the um, is the Steam store. Um, particularly if you have it set up to launch something like um, um, I like uh, Civilization VI, right? For an example, and some of those other um, turn by turn simulation games. Um, those will. Um, for some reason under Linux in that particular distribution will lock up. So if I do my PS space dash AUX and I just see those sort of zombie processes sitting there, I can do a, a kill dash nine now grant. This is all level one user programs and, and free those up by giving the appropriate PIDs. Um, but you can also in a program, right, make these system calls as well to do it. Um, and then down here, you can also make a time system call. And I'll give you a number of seconds that has elapsed since January 1st of 1970. That's a bit before I even came into this world. And a uh, good bit, actually. And uh, and uh, it's going to give, but then you have to use like um, some time formatting um, call and C or something like that to actually make it look pretty. Right? So. Otherwise, just having a number of seconds isn't always that helpful unless you're subtracting one from another and just trying to get a raw number of seconds or something along those lines. And note that on 32-bit Linux systems, it can only that can only return 32-bit words. So the maximum time value you can return is 2 to the 32nd minus 1 seconds, right? Because it's a 32-bit machine after all. Without, you know, having to do some extended song and dance on it. Which means if you only return back a 32-bit value, um, given the maximum value of an unsigned integer in, in Unix type systems, 32-bit um, systems run out of time in the year 2106. So take that for what it is, right? 2018, uh, 2118. Yeah, my, my, my daughter will be a, a very, very old person in 2106 if she makes it that far. And, uh, you know, I will since long be gone, and probably all of you too. So, um, anyhow, we'll see how that goes. All right. Um, Windows is interesting, so I'm going to try to give Windows a little bit more treatment in this course this time around. Um, as always, I, I like to do more than what I'm able to do in my in my head. I, I, I'm able to do a lot more than what I really have time for, and things always take longer than you expect it to. But needless to say, we'll give it a shot. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about it. Um, Windows tends to separate the underlying system call implementations from the actual user libraries APIs. So Windows has a collection of APIs, and sort of the original or core one that is still used to this day is the Win32 API. Never mind, we have 64-bit Windows operating systems, right? It's still referred to as the Win32 API. And, um, and there are a lot of equivalents to Linux, uh, Unix-type um, system calls, um, but not complete correspondence. And they have a lot of calls that you don't find in POSIX-compliant systems or even the, just outside of POSIX on Unix or Linux system, particularly in the GUI area. And um, there's some things here that Windows doesn't really have an analog for as well. So just, you know, just be aware of that. But for instance, um, in Win32, instead of fork, you have create process. And typically speaking, create process is a fork and an execute uh, VE combined together. Uh, there's no notion of a parent-child process relationship. It's just you create a process. It has its own unique, you know, set of resources and its own program code and you know, text section, and it just goes on. Um, you can have a given, any given process wait uh, on another process to exit, and you just supply either like a negative one for anything, or you can have it just uh, sit there and wait for a particular process, and a lot of variations on that. Um, you know, and that really just speaks to the fact that a Unix program consists of code that does something 
um, like you know, to just make system calls to have certain services perform. And Windows is just this event driven system. All right, and there's really is an, a, a main event driven loop in, in Windows programs, and it responds to all sorts of different messages across the operating system, and particularly GUI driven ones like mouse click and mouse enter and mouse exit and window move and drag uh, drop and all sorts of things. Um, the main program waits for some event to happen and basically calls a procedure for it to happen. And this is true in other systems like JavaFX or, or, or Qt or Qt, depending on how you like to pronounce it. Um, you know, and, and, and whatnot. Um, you know, so keys being struck, the mouse being moved, the mouse button being pushed, USB drive being inserted, so on and so forth. You, you get the picture. Um, some other calls here. Um, Oh, and, and thing too is when these these events happen, handlers are used um, to process that event. So, the event happens, a handler is dispatched to the actual code that handles the event. Screen is updated with the new internal program state. Um, Unix systems, you know, like I said, you just um, I mentioned before that there's this in Windows world there's a decoupling between the system call. In the system, in the library call API system, in Unix, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Everything is very aligned. It makes it simpler, but less flexible in some ways. Um, you could say that the Windows way is more unwieldy, right? Since the system calls underneath can um, change all the time. But really, it's just good architecture design in one sense because you want the user just to use the library code. You can replace the system calls underneath. As long as the interfaces are the same, right? From, you know, who cares about the internal implementation? They make the system call changes, right? As long as that's stable. Um, so. And you can see a few of these others on here. Um, let's see here. Um, these six calls here um, outside of exit process. From here, yeah, these all just control various ways of, of working with files. So, like create files equivalent to open on Unix systems, close is equivalent to close a handle because you get a handle for everything in Windows. Instead of a file ID, you get handles. You get handles for everything, just not files, but resources and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, read files and write files are read and write, right? And LSeq has uh, as the equivalent of set file pointer, and stat has the equivalent of get file. Attributes. Um, I forget what the X is. Is it, is it expanded or extended or something along those lines? It's probably there was an original GIF file attributes in Win 16. I don't know. You probably have to go talk to uh, one of those old Microsoft uh, uh, um, graybeards, right? And and they probably tell you there there was a difference or not there. So anyhow, so if you go to Microsoft's documentation system online. You'll notice that there's a whole variety of, um, you know, kind of lists some of the different APIs here. So, how they get started with desktop apps, how they get started with the Windows UI library, how they get started with Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, Windows Terminal, Python, and other tools. Um, in terms of, you know, where the developer was starting, here's the app platforms. Uh, the unified uh, Windows platform for sort of the modern desktop apps, um, Win32, which is their underlying low level. Classic API, uh, Windows Presentation Foundation, which came before UWP, I believe, and um, it's a different mode of building, I guess, .NET compatible type GUI applications. And there's also was Windows Form. Um, I, I don't do Windows programming, so I'm not too keen on the differences between these two systems. Here, I just I'm pretty sure I believe that UWP is sort of the modern version of doing things. But Win32, if you want to roll your own on doing all the GUI stuff, it still works even to this day. So, and I, and I have built some Win32 programs way in the past, um, you know, working at different places. So, all right. Oh, and by the way, you can run you can run 16-bit programs on Win30 on Windows 32-bit Windows versions, but you can't run it on 64-bit. You can only run 32-bit on 64, 16 on 32. But the 16-bit interfaces are still part of the Win32 APIs, so, um, so that's interesting. 
Um, the next thing is the um, various other, um, like the directory management, like make directory, remove directories, create directory, remove directory. It's just Windows names are longer. Uh, the, it says it doesn't support links. It's not true since Vista, basically. There is like create symbolic link A or create symbolic um, or remove symbolic link, I think, A. Um, and obviously there's the command line utility that'll do that stuff too. Um, so unlink has the Windows equivalent of a delete file and I'm sure it works on the symbolic link in a similar way. Um, there's a mount and unmount set of commands in, in, in Linux that really doesn't have an equivalent per se in Windows other than say that you can do set volume mount point A or W. Uh, I think one's for using an ASCII, one's for Y characters. Uh, two byte characters. Um, that's sort of an outgrowth of before. Windows supported Unicode. It had to support code pages and had to support the OS in different languages. And it led to some of these different, you know, um, library calls that have an A or a W, that sort of thing on the end of it. So, um, but yeah, you can do things as the mount. There are mount point calls that you can do in it. Change directory, a set current directory, change mod doesn't really have an equivalent because it uses the um, access control list conventions, which are a much different security mechanism for protecting files and other types of resources. Uh, it does have protection, it's just it's not done with protection bits, it's done with a different system entirely. Um, kill, um, Windows that does not support singles, and I don't. I really think that is true. I don't know of any equivalent nowadays for that. And uh, get local time is equivalent to time on on Unix or Linux systems. So here's the mk link make link command for doing the hard or soft links um, at the command prompts. Right, and that works. It may not be compatible with all user programs, especially if they're older 132 programs. And there's a shell extension you can get actually to do it from Windows Explorer from that link below. So have fun with that. I would, if you can build a virtual machine um, instead of using your own local system for doing this stuff and experimenting, I would just to be safe, right? Um, and go from there. Right. I'm gonna pause and then start up here in a second. Okay, let's move on to our next topic. Let's look at the different uh, architecture types that operating systems can correspond to. So we have monolithic systems, we have layered systems, we have microkernels, client server systems, virtual machines, and exokernels. Right? So it's not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of active research. That people are trying to figure out new methods of, of doing things. Uh, most current uh, research are variations uh, on to uh, microkernels. So. So there we go, let's look at each of these. Um, in a monolithic system, you have basically a single program in kernel mode. You have a collection of procedures indicated by these circles that are linked together, all as a single executable. Each procedure is free to call another. It's all one address process space anyways. Um, this can be an unwieldy system. It can be difficult to debug, it can be difficult to improve. It is more efficient um, if, if things stay stable and reliable and robust, but again, it's harder in these systems. Um, but even here, we do see some structure, right? Parameters are placed in a well-defined places on a, on a stack somewhere, and then trap instructions are used to switch modes. Um, so a main program invokes various service providers, may carry out system calls, and they may utilize various utility procedures on the way to help them um, um, assist with those calls. Right? And you can still have loadable extensions for shared libraries and drivers. Nothing says you can't have those sorts of things and then load them um, at the time the given process needs it. Or as the kernel's running doing the same, it says it can't utilize a shared library or driver as needed. So, um, And this is basically Windows, more or less. At least uh, based on the author's claim at the time. I have not reviewed any leaked uh, source code dumps of Windows that have occurred within the last year that, that, I've, that I've heard about. Um, so I don't know if this is really the case. I haven't read any advanced analysis on this, but it's out there anyways. Um, layered systems are sort of a generalization of monolithic systems. 
the first approach at this was the THE system, literally T-H-E, all in caps. And it was built by um, Dijkstra and his students when he was at his school in the Netherlands. And a later attempt that improved on this was the Multics system. It's been very popular for many decades and only was in the 20, early 2010s that the last of those systems went offline. Um, the original the system um, that that was it, the original hardware that utilized the the system uh, was was very primitive by our modern standard 32,027 bit words or basically 164k of memory and um, memory is expensive right and pretty much each layer provided a set of services so that the layer above it no longer had to worry about how things were being done it had a set of abstractions that it could tie into so layer zero provided the basic multiprocessing of the systems so layers above it didn't have to worry about it. so you know one process could be working on doing some of the CPU another could be doing with IO right for instance um, and then you know that multiprocessing handled that uh, layer one did the memory management either from sort of a, a, a set of core memory elements or from a, dr a slower drum memory and so processes above layer one didn't have to worry about if things were on the drum or the or in the core memory it just managed all that for you um, and obviously the drum was a lot larger but it was also a lot slower um, layer two did the communications between the processes and um, operator consoles so anything above here didn't have to worry about IPC type things um, at the layer 3 is your input output management which is working with IO devices buffering streams to and from so that user programs could just use abstractions to do reading and writing the files and all that stuff not worrying about streams and managing the streams and clearing out buffers and all that good stuff and then layer 4 programs didn't have to worry, you know, not only the file type elements, but didn't have to worry about process elements, I/O management, that sort of things. And obviously, layer five is the operator. So, anyhow, and uh, later on, the multi system came along, and I realize this is really hard to see, but it had this notion of a set of concentric rings, um, this ring enforcement mechanism, and res in the you could kind of violate the layers and go back and forth. The ring mechanisms were in, were enforced. Now you say what well, you can see ring zero and rings one and seven here. Um, like well, this doesn't look very ring like, but it served as the notion for creating sort of these different rings that um, utilize, are utilized in later processor designs and operating systems that support that to provide a enforcement mechanism between user processes and kernel processes. Anyway, so multi was kind of described as having a circuitry concentric rings, the inner ones being more privileged than the outer ones. Uh, procedure now, we're going to want to make a call to an inner ring. You had to make the equivalent of a system call or issue a trap instruction. Parameters were validated for um, um, author authorization purposes before the call was allowed to proceed. Um, and the entire operating system was part of the address space of each user process in multi So no one could bring the entire system down, right? The hardware made it possible to designate individual procedures or memory segments um, as being protected against reading or writing or executing, that sort of thing. Um, so it was a pretty robust system for its time. And because of how architecturally robust it was, it had a lot of staying power. Um, microkernels um, are fascinating little things here you put as little as possible into the actual kernel, right? You have a system process and a clock that is, helps to support the system process. Um, the goal me being to ha minimize any bugs um, being capable of bringing the entire operating system down, right? So in a, in, a, in a monolith, if you have a bug in an audio driver and it crashes, you're, you've lost your whole system, you have to reboot. In a microkernel, you only lose the audio driver until some daemon process and come along and restart it. And because of you know the history of mo of like uh, monolithic kernels, there's a reason why PCs have a power button, right, and a reset button. So the the provide you various forms of restart when things go back. Embedded systems are different. For instance, like what they have these watchdog um, abstractions, which is basically a, something that looks for a heartbeat from other um, pieces of hardware. And if that's not provided every so often, then the driver attached to it, 
um, doesn't supply that, it, it just forces a reboot of the system. So, without having to have a button. Um, so, you know, there's, you talked about the study in, in, in there about bugs. So it's not uncommon to have 2 to 10 bugs per 10,000 lines of code. So a modern operating system could have anywhere from 10 to 50,000 bugs in it at any given time, right? And that's assuming you're 5, 5 million lines. Um, if it's 50 million lines like some, like Windows or whatever, it's 100,000 to 500,000 bugs, right? Given its long legacy and wide device support and wide process support over decades, yeah, it, it could be that bad. Is it truly that way? Eh, it's hard to say. Um, a lot of them are probably security related bugs, like things that could, you know, like you could generate a buffer overflow in a procedure somehow and do some sort of stack corruption and point it to where you want your code to run. There's probably a lot of those things. Um, actual logical bugs are probably less extensive. So, anyhow, um, let's see here. So, anyway, so then, yeah, so all these other components of the operating system um, are broken up into these sort of small, well defined modules. They all run in user mode land. And the microkernel has just a. Um, anyway, it's just is basically involved in um, sort of um, managing the communication. Um, you know, between the other components. Um, and it tends to be sort of a more power efficient mechanism, right? To do this, so you're not jumping back and forth between modes, which chews up a lot of extra processing cycles because those are expensive calls. Because the stack is, and, and all the other registers and all the other bookkeeping structures aren't being swapped out and repopulated. So it's, it's it not only saves time, it's faster, it actually saves power, especially important on mobile devices. Best example, it would be like Mac OS X would be with its basis in, in the mock uh, kernel. There's others that occur. Um, Minix is actually a microkernel, um, very small microkernel, very small operating system, but um, it's there. And uh, others would be K4204, Pike OS, QNX, um, which is popular in automobiles. Uh, Symbian, which was sort of a an older um, um, operating system for uh, for some mobile devices, for some personal digital assistants, that sort of thing. Hmm. So, and anyways, with the um, you know those types of systems, they're they're posi conformant, they're open source. Uh, Minix three is um, about 12,000 lines of C, 1,400 lines of assembler. Um, C code manages and schedules the processes, handles inter-process communication. Um, there's about 40, only 40 system calls in Minix. Um, has um, performs uh, functions like cooking handlers to interrupt inside of the sys, uh, moving data between addresses, spaces, installing memory maps. Um, device driver for the clock is also in kernel because it has to work closely with the scheduler. Um, it's just it's just a very core piece of functionality. You can't really separate that out. Other device drivers run sort of separate user processes. And you have sort of these different layers even within that for drivers at the lowest layer and servers and then user programs above it. There is one server called the reincarnation server here whose job is to come along and see if other servers has died and restart them up. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, so that's microkernels and that's Minix. Um, so client-server models, so in this, in this mode of operation, this is a variation of microkernels. You have two classes of process, servers and clients, right? Servers provide services. And they may or may not be located on the same machine. They could be widely dispersed nodes across the network, right? So you could think of network communications in this case. And whether or not it occurs on the machines are sort of in the same box 
or they're distributed across the network, everything is done by message passing from clients, servers, and responses that come back. Um, so it could be on net different networks, no one would be any of the wiser, but, but it can be same network, could be same box, even, right? Um, and it's just basically an abstraction, right? And the web's like this too, think about it. So. Right. Then we have virtual machines. Virtual machines aren't a new concept, they're many decades old in terms of uh, being thought up of, being thought of. Um, the original one was sort of CP slash CMS that became sort of this VM370. Um, so from time sharing systems, it was noted that you could have multi-programming and an extended machine with a more convenient interface than sort of the bigger hardware. So in VM370, just basically separated those components out. Um, in the heart of the machine, known as the virtual machine monitor, which becomes later known as the type one hypervisor, it runs on bare metal, kind of like um, VMware ESX, all right, which is different from what you guys used in Lab 1. It's the thing that's used for, uh, some of you may have used in the uh, software engineering course when we set up different um, virtual machine containers for you to use. It, VMware EXXI is sort of this hypervisor, type 1 hypervisor. And um, it provides, it, it, it runs its own sort of little mini OS essentially. And then you control, generate other OSs and you dedicate resources um, to it that are kind of divvied up from, um, from what's available on the box. And, and it, it helps manage all that stuff for you. Um, in this incarnation here, you can see a virtual 370s. Um, one mode is to operate as sort of a batch type mode. Um, another would be like in sort of this um, CMS sort of uh, uh, time sharing mode, this conversational monitor system mode. Um, and what happens is there's a heart of the machine called the uh, the virtual machine monitor and um, you know, so here's your bare hardware, here's your virtual machine monitor and here's your virtual 370s um, and it does the multi-programming and it doesn't provide just one but it provides a few different machines up on the next layer here right so there's system calls, this go to a trap and well you have are exact copies of the bare hardware including the kernel and user mode, IO, the interrupts and everything else the real machine has and this thing helps just manage those pieces together. So. so what else do you want to say about it? CM, one of these CMS units or virtual machines are the, um, then could issue commands, uh, um, normal hardware I.O. commands, and then it catches it and um, put the virtual machine monitor and runs it as though it has total control of that box, right? So it's just sort of simulating the real hardware. Right? And this would, you know, ZOS became sort of the successor to VM370. And by this point in time, you could run multiple operating systems, you could run multiple Linux virtual machines or IBM operating systems. And it might actually be across multiple systems. All right, so you can break, you have multiple systems all controlled by one um, a, a virtual machine, a virtual system monitor. Right? And here is probably an older system for the Clark County School District with ties into different user applications, right? And so there's user applications and then like school police system and the development system, the alternative system. And I don't know what a lot of those are for, but they're obviously important to the operation of that particular county government. And you know, obviously these successors had things like, it had sort of like this uh, message of the day thing for someone about ready to log in. And um, I guess it, it worked for them, so, all right. Um, so eventually the virtual monitor um, became type one, type two hypervisors. So today, companies kind of look at virtualization as a way to run multiple servers and these containers on the same machine without having a crash of one server bringing the entire um, box down or a whole bunch of, you know, 
or having a whole bunch of services or servers running on one system and a crash in one of them, especially they're all kind of kernel space type entities, bringing the whole box down. Um, and a lot of times what would happen is if you have one service um, or one server per box, you had a lot of waste, so you'd have a lot of extra real estate to hold the, all these servers that may or may not get used to all, all the time. Whereas if you had virtual machines, um, you know, you could make far better use of that one box of commodity hardware um, and run multiple operating systems like, you know, Windows and Linux and that sort of thing. Um, so type 1 hypervisor and then we have type 2 hypervisor and a more practical type 2, right, as a kernel module. Um, so the virtual machine monitor became a type 1 hypervisor. Um, in order to do this, the CPU must be virtualizable, which means that for a user mode virtual machine, when it issues a privileged instruction, such as modifying the program status word or doing uh, interrupt output type operations on a device driver, the hardware has to be able to, to handle that trap from that user mode virtual machine monitor so that instruction can be emulated in software. If the processor can't do that, can't support that type of conversion, like on Pentium chips and older, then it can be supported. So that's why you never saw virtualization uh, back in the day on those systems. And then some CPUs uh, are, you know, and then later on what happened was you had some efforts out of Stanford and Cambridge for Disco and Zen that became VMware and Zen. And then you had Hyper-V and VirtualBox and all sorts of other things that came along later. And VMware EXI and then VMware Client, right, that you guys used. Um, um, that came along and the first things that they did was basically figure out ways to translate blocks of codes and keep them in a cache and then later on um, you know and that led to what were called machine simulators or binary translations which was a, a good development but not good enough for industry use um, get away from having to use multiple um, server boxes and later on um, in type 2 hypervisors um, there was a host operating system um, that was created that made use of being able to create processes and store files and, and um, it, it was able to use this host operating system to create the process store files and all that sort of stuff um, and then obviously kernel modules could be put into that host operating system that could be tapped into that sped things up as well so and you can kind of see how this changed over time so and mentioned uh, Java virtual machine is a virtual machine, all right. Um, we think it was sort of a, a run. I mean, it is a runtime sort of entity, but it really is a virtualized machine. And we saw that too with the IJVM in, 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 in computer architecture. So pretty much you have your compiled class code files that comes from the Java uh, compiler um, that generates those JVM intermediate codes. And um, so the compiler produces code for JVM and is typically executed by a software JVM interpreter, right? Since these are virtualized instances, they're sort of pseudo pro, you know, they're not real processors, they're not a real bit of JVM hardware, right? They run these on, so that's why these run just in time sort of um, interpreters. Um, the approach is that you can basically ship this code anywhere over the internet and have it run on a computer as a, a, a Java runtime on it, right, with this uh, Java virtual machine. Um, if the compiler produced Spark code or x86 code or PowerPC code or 6800K or 68K code, um, you couldn't ship it and run it anywhere as easily, right? Now, yes, there's been emulators on certain platforms or other platforms, but they're really slow. And obviously, if the interpreter is done well, then the programs can be checked for safety and executed in a protective environment to keep damage from occurring. And you can see how these work and, and so on and so forth. Right. And then this just defines how the class loading process occurs. So you load classes from Java home uh, path and then the runtime jar, right? And there's the extension classes that have their classes that get loaded. And the application class files load. Um, anything that's along the class path that 
the user application depends on, and sometimes there are custom um, class uh, loaders that need to have classes that are loaded. So. And then the final type of kernel is the exokernel. So instead of doing the actual machine as it's done with virtual machines, you partition all the available resources within a block of hardware, and so that no two um, um, applications can have their um, can overlap in terms of resources. They just have a dedicated set. It's like you take the hardware and you divide it up to a bunch of little small pieces, and then each application gets that small piece. So you can have those pieces each run in isolation without affecting the other one. And this research goes back to the 90s as well in terms of an exokernel. And you can see one particular implementation here. Um, so one machine might get blocks 0 to 120, 1023, and then one's 1024 to 2047. Um, the bottom layer is running in kernel mode. Um, so there's a program called the exokernel, right? And it handles the work on the frame buffer, translation, look side buffers, network memory disks, and secure bindings, and all that good stuff. Um, so it separates the multi-programming from the user operating system code, but it does so with less overhead than, say, in a virtual machine. Um, so each library has to sort of implement its own system objects and policies that way. And uh, that's pretty much it. And just a quick note, um, on units in this chapter, um, metric units are used instead of traditional units, uh, like uh, in English, like the furlong stone fortnight system. All right, um, as it would be in the Queen's system. And uh, the prefixes are typically abbreviated um, by their first letters with units greater than one capitalized, as as you can see. So kilo, mega, giga, tera, peta, exa, zelta, milta. And then you have units below one, uh, again, in, in lowercase, milli, micro, nano, pico, femto, apto, zapto, and milto. So, and... Um, Typically, the difference between milli and micro um, is that milli has an M, micro, mm, micro has a mu for the Greek letter mu that looks like a looks like an M, but it's a Greek mu, right? So it's different. Um, so, and really, the smallest scales that we deal with in processors are things that are in in, in picoseconds and femtoseconds, right? We're kind of dealing with stuff in these ranges. Um, so a lot of times still in nanoseconds, right? Um, and and so on. And then when we deal with things like storage uh, sizes and that sort of things, we're dealing with things in you know, gigatera and peta ranges nowadays. So, uh, so, you know, things are... So a one terabyte database takes up 10, 20, or 10, 12 bytes of storage. There you can have a 100 picosecond uh, clock, right? Um, kilo is going to be uh, 1024. Now, n though networks like um, transfer rates like uh, are done in kilobits per second, or thousands, or megabits per second, so million, right, so on and so forth. And um, but memories are done in this, you know, binary powers of two sort of thing. So a gigabyte of memory is you know a billion seventy three million, you know, so on and so forth. But it's easy to mix them up. Right. That concludes uh, chapter one.